Our topic tonight is the historical apostles. So we've had a lecture, the most popular lecture so far this year was on the historical Jesus. And a lot of people have uh, written in and asked, uh, okay, well, we've kind of set that groundwork of kind of establishing kind of the baseline, the existence of the historical Jesus, and let's say the minimum um, component of the story of which there's a historical consensus, what we can say for sure about the historical Jesus. And we gave a couple of the, um, the, the multiple defensible, academically defensible models uh, we cited several of those that different scholars have constructed based on that uh, initial foundation. But several people have said, well, what about some of the other characters uh, in the story, in the New Testament story? Um, and so I thought, well, a, a, a good place to start might be to look at uh, the apostles and to try to reconstruct them and to see what historical basis we have for apostles in general for, and for individual apostles in particular. So, let me begin. Um, in northwestern Spain, in the capital of the region of Galicia, Santiago de Compostela is a cathedral with a shrine uh, and a tomb of Santiago. So, as early as the 11th century, this was a um, blockbuster destination. Pilgrims from all over Western Europe uh, streamed on pathways across the Pyrenees into Spain to make their way to this shrine. The Camino de Santiago, as it's called, the Way of St. James, as we call it in English, continues to this day. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, and so forth. It attracts some 200,000 pilgrims per year uh, now. Here's a, if you can see it anyway, kind of a map of the northernmost part of Spain with the route of the pilgrimage through all of these sort of ancient Christian medieval uh, centers. And of course, along the entire pathway, which is marked, you know, there's little shrines that are historic that go all the way back to the Middle Ages, little and big shrines, because uh, it was, such a, a, let's say, what we might even call a tourist route. It was a pilgrimage route, but our modern, um, uh, our modern tradition of tourism actually directly evolves out of the medieval practice of pilgrimage. You might remember that in the early Middle Ages, when um, the shrine here got going, uh, Christian, Christian kingdoms in, in Spain were kind of uh, scattered up this way because most of Spain was in Muslim hands and in fact was having kind of this um, golden age of uh, Andalusia of southern uh, Muslim Spain. All right, so the tomb of Santiago. The original attraction uh, that got this pilgrimage thing going and has kept it going is the tomb of Santiago the Apostle. So Santiago is Galician for Saint Jacob or as the name is very confusingly rendered in English, St. James. <laughs> so everywhere, although we, we in the, in the um, uh, as a result of the translation into the King James Bible, um, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew part of it, the name Jacob is translated as Jacob, as in the patriarch Jacob and so forth. But everywhere in the New Testament, I mean, the translation comes from the Greek or through the Greek, um, uh, the King James translators rendered the name Jacob as James, um, you know, to gain favor of the king, right? And so, anyway, as a result of that, English has this strange um, phenomenon where, where we call, anyway, saints like Jacob, Iago, we say James. So, according to the lists of the Twelve in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, this James, the son of Zebedee, is one of two apostles named James, the other being the son of Alphaeus, and thus this one is called James the Great. And then there is another figure, as we'll see, called James the Less, who is sometimes conflated with this other apostle, James, son of Alphaeus. We'll talk about that later. So this is the tomb, right? The tomb of an apostle, and not just a little apostle, this is James the Great. 
So how did one of Jesus' apostles end up in Galicia, of all places? So according to the book of Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament, James was part of the Jerusalem church until Herod the king, by which it's meant um, Herod Agrippa, we can tell from uh, Josephus' uh, history, until Herod Agrippa I executed him. So according to medieval Galicians, his body was then taken by angels who placed it into a, a rudderless boat that was unattended by any humans, and that boat made its way through divine means all the way to the shores of Galicia, uh, where it was then moved and brought to a shrine inland, uh, not shrine, it was buried in what later became a shrine. So his tomb was then rediscovered in the year 814 by Pelagius the Hermit. Uh, the local bishop, Galicia Theodomerus of Iria, uh, told King Alfonso II of Asturias and Galicia about the find, and a shrine was then built to welcome pilgrims as they started to want to see this great wonder of the discovery of the tomb of one of Jesus' apostles, important apostle, leave them. So later legends told of how St. James had actually been the first Christian missionary to come to Galicia prior to his execution back in, in Judea, Palestine. Um, but uh, anyway, so he went to Galicia, established a church there, went back where he got executed according to this tradition. But there are no sources for these traditions earlier than the 700s. And thus, although it's an old tradition, you know, over a thousand years old here, it doesn't have any historical basis. It doesn't take us all the way back to um, the time of James, you know, six or 700 years out of, uh, before, created six or 700, 800 years later. Okay, there is though context for the shrine's invention. So while there's no associations in Galicia with St. James prior to the 700s, finding his tomb fits the period in which it's found. So at this time, uh, in the central and then the later Middle Ages, as Western Christians began rebuilding after the decline of late antiquity in the early Middle Ages, what sometimes we think of as the Dark Ages, when there was so little building happening of any kind as, uh, as the Roman government was replaced with uh, the local different Germanic kingdoms and so forth, relics and saints, I'm sorry, bodies of saints were essential for new church's holiness. And Christians all across Europe competed to buy, or in some cases create, and in other cases actually even steal relics. And so for example, uh, Venetian sailors famously stole the body of Saint Mark, Saint Mark the Evangelist, that was traditionally understood to be housed in Alexandria, where there's a patriarchate, the patriarch or Pope, as he's sometimes called, of Alexandria, uh, to this day considers himself to be the successor of St. Mark. They stole that body uh, and brought it back to Venice where they built St. Mark's <laughs> Basilica uh, in Venice to house it, this magnificent place on the, on the Piazza of Venice. And, um, uh, and as a result of that, um, Venice is even called the Republic of St. Mark. In other words, St. Mark, Mark becomes the, the patron of Venice. Relics associated with characters in scripture were very potent. So in other words, Mark here is associated with Mark the Evangelist. That's why you would want his shrine and his body. Thus, for example, the monks of Saint-Denis, uh, which is the, uh, an, an abbey just to the north of Paris where the uh, royal crypt of the French kings is housed, um, those monks forgot that their abbey was named for Denis, or in, in Greek Dionysius, a third century Gallic bishop. And instead, they began to associate the name of their monastery, Denis, with Denis the Areopagite, Dionysius the Areopagite, a character in the book of Acts. So less ambitious than Galicia, which a uh, very little place out the very fringes of Europe, which decided that they were going to pull off claiming that they have the uh, tomb of one of the major apostles. 
And again, less than, I mean, Paris is picking somebody, a small character like Dionysius, the Areopagite, is not a big deal. Um, a couple years ago, we went and visited the city of Verona, and we found a shrine there uh, that claimed to have the relics of the boy who supplied the loaves and fishes during the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So in other words, they got somebody, not a major character from the New Testament, the guy doesn't even have a name in the New Testament, but you know, essentially during a major miracle, uh, everybody needs to be fed. Uh, Jesus asked, well, what do we have? And there's a kid who has some uh, pieces of bread and some fish. That kid, according to the tradition in Verona, grew up and eventually made his way to Verona and they have his relics there. So you can see how there is a context for uh, finding these kind of uh, connections, believing that you have uh, the relics or bodies of characters from the New Testament. Okay, so when we're doing history and we're talking about historicity, historicity is not about proving uh, something impossible. So non-historians may respond, they often respond, the fact that none of the sources we have for Galicia show associations with St. James, that doesn't prove that angels could not have brought the body there in a rudderless boat. And so they might say, well, I therefore believe that the tomb contains his body. So the response to that is, you can believe, obviously people can believe all the things they want to believe, that's fine. But there is no historical basis for this belief. That belief can said to be false from a historical perspective because we can date the beginning of when the narrative happens, we can date the context for that narrative, and we can show that this association does not go all the way back to the first century where James is, like I say, much later claimed to have been the first founder of Christianity in the area, right? Okay, that should be no detraction from a thousand plus year tradition, you know? So the non-historicity of the tomb does not detract from the living millennium old tradition of hiking the Camino de Santiago. I'm perfectly do not believe that the body of St. James is in that tomb, and I would still really like to do this, um, this pilgrimage if I had the time to do it. It would be um, it's a wonderful, amazing thing that people find meaningful. So it's a spiritual practice that has potential to be like a once in a lifetime, even a life-changing experience that could connect you with fellow pilgrims, with friends or family that you bring along, with your historic roots, with people of the past, with your faith, with the divine, with God, there's all kinds of different ways, different things that uh, the spiritual practice could still be employed by. It's not, the historicity of the tomb is not relevant to that, right? So I wanna talk about that in general as we do this. So living tradition versus, and scripture versus history. So we've made the distinction between the living tradition of Jesus Christ in Christianity, the Christ of theology, the Jesus of scriptures, and the historical Jesus. And likewise, in this presentation, we will look at the distinctions between the traditions about the apostles, stories in scripture about the apostles, and what we can say about the historical basis of each of the apostles, the apostles and each thereof that we'll talk about. Okay, so we'll begin with a question. How many apostles were there? And if we had a audience here, we'd have, we did used to before all the pandemic, people could be raising their hands and, and, and wondering, am I trying to ask them a trick question? Is this a trick question? <laughs> so should be, um, uh, one of the, the things about apostles is there's a particular number that is associated with apostles. So was the trick question, was I trying to say, oh, well, no, no, it's only 11 because Judas Iscariot, the apostle who betrayed Jesus, was kicked out? No, 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 because according to the book of Acts, Judas got replaced by a guy named Matthias, about whom we know nothing else than, than just that snippet. Uh, that is mentioned in the book of Acts. So in other words, there's 12 even after, after Judas. So the answer though is no, it's not just 12. In fact, there were many, many more than 12 apostles in the first generations of Christianity. 
In fact, the 12 are a subset of a much larger group of apostles. So that is much more than I, I have shown in the schematic. The schematic here is just meant to say many. There's many apostles other than uh, the 12. The 12 are also understood to have been a group within that set, apostles, a subset. So for example, um, one of the ones we should know here, I'm just highlighting one of these apostles who's not in the 12, but is in the group of apostles, Paul. So Paul is arguably the second most famous of the apostles after Peter, and probably the most influential of the apostles, including Peter. And Paul, though, was never one of the 12. So what does it mean, apostle, then? What is apostle? The title apostle, apostolos in Greek, literally means the one who is sent off in the sense of a messenger, an ambassador, and so forth. And so we've done um, lectures before on the historical Jesus and on the earliest Christianities, lost Christianities, and one of the, um, one of the pictures um, that we have painted of what perhaps the earliest Jesus movement or the historical Jesus movement might have been, a pre-Christian movement still, uh, where the name Christian has not even been applied to it at all yet. Um, it was a Jewish sect that was centered on, on a mendicant, that is to say, a begging for your daily bread, spiritual group that renounced such worldly entanglements as property and so forth. So then from that group, which is kind of like a group that might be seen as a similar to being like a group of Buddhist monks that are supported by the broader Buddhist community around them because these, um, these people who have renounced worldly entanglements and are you know, like the Buddhist monks are also living by um, the donation of their food every day by the broader community. And part of the reason for it is, is that they're a, a spiritual bridge for the broader community. These are people that are uh, removed from worldly entanglements and thus they're closer to God and, and the spiritual world, right? Uh, Buddhists don't worry about so much about God, but anyway, and they're more worried, they're not worldly and they're a connection that way. In this case, and for Christians, it's definitely a connection to God. And so, um, and so that group then, that central mendicant group, would send out um, what, what is it, messengers or ambassadors, what are called apostles, to share the group's message with sympathetic supporters living in the world and possibly also to gather um, donations to bring back to the group, although uh, we'll see how, how that works in terms of what the evidence is. Certainly Paul is collecting donations uh, on behalf of a group called the Poor of Jerusalem. Uh, and it's one of the things that he is asking for, for all of his um, uh, church communities that he has planted among uh, non-Jewish, Greek-speaking um, uh, Christians who are much better off in terms of property and wealth and so on in the cities of the Greek-speaking cities of the Eastern Roman Empire, Greece and Turkey and so forth. And he's trying to collect alms in order to help support this central mendicant, say Franciscan or ben, Franciscan monk or friar-like um, group that uh, was existing in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. So God, in the Gospels, we have descriptions of the apostolic role. So the Gospel of Mark, which is the earliest of our four Gospels that are in the canon to have been written, has a description of Jesus' instructions for sending forth apostles. The Q sayings gospel preserves a second set of these instructions. So as you're probably aware, we've had a bunch of lectures where we talk about the synoptic problem, how the gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke are related to each other. It's mostly understood by scholars that uh, Mark is the earliest of the gospels that survives. Matthew and Luke both use Mark as a source, but also have another lost source that they are using, a source of Jesus' sayings that scholars call Q. So uh, the Q sayings gospel preserves a second set. 
the author of Matthew synthesized the two sets. So they're pretty similar. He takes the Q set and the Mark set and brings them together. Whereas the author of Luke actually includes both of them back to back. So Luke uses the first one from Mark for the sending forth of the first 12 apostles. And then Luke uses the second set of instructions for sending forth 70 more apostles. Probably originally in the manuscript it would have been 72 because 72 is a more holy number. It's half of 144, which is 12 times 12, so you can imagine why. Anyway, 72 is probably what most scholars think it should be. Although we use the word um, 70 in my denomination, so uh, we have in Community of Christ uh, positions called uh, for 12 apostles, and then we have a position for the 70, and actually that's one of my roles. So I uh, have a calling as a 70 in Community of Christ. Okay, so let's look at this uh, first um, uh, description of what an apostle is to do. This is found in Mark chapter 6. He, Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. So no bread, no bag, no money in their belts but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed uh, that all should repent. They cast out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Okay, so let's look at a couple of the characteristics of what this is saying uh, the role of apostle is. So it's a spiritual emissary authorized by Jesus. So um, they're authorized uh, to have authority over unclean spirits, and they cast out demons, which is one of the things that uh, Jesus is said to do. And they also anoint with oil many who are sick, and so they do faith healing. So the spiritual uh, spiritual healings. Note here that these sent, what part, one of the details is they're sent out, but they're sent out in pairs, and one of the things that they are doing is proclaiming the message. So uh, repent, turn your life around, uh, be, uh, be aware not of all of the things you think are important, but of the spiritual truths that are really important in the world, and so forth. And then they're mendicant. They're not to have property with a couple exceptions. In other words, you can have sandals, you can have one tunic, but you're not to bring a change of clothes even, in other words, on this thing. You are to live by donations. So there's, you can have a staff, but no bread, no bag, no money, and so on. And wherever you enter a house, so in other words, um, you, you're not bringing a tent with you, but when people, when you're going around as a, a mendicant beggar, you enter a community, um, some people, local people, might invite you into the house, uh, and you stay in that house until you leave the place. So it's not like um, you start staying there because, you, you know, uh, that seems like a pretty good place, but later a much richer person who lives in the town says, hey, hey I've, got a, I've got a really great place for you to stay, and you can have great food and so on. You're not to do that. That's not what this is about, you know. So well, as long as you're going to be in that place, you go to that first house you entered and so on. Okay, so here's the second description. Uh, the one that's found in Luke. So the author of Luke more or less repeats Mark's instructions to the apostles when sending out the 12th, so that's in the preceding chapter, Luke 9, but then includes this account from the Q saying source in chapter 10. So it reads uh, in this part in Luke, He, Jesus, said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. And so that's kind of the preface uh, from Luke. But then here's the instructions. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, 
the kingdom of God has come near to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at the small contradictions in the instructions. So this is a place where both Mark and Q are both repeating something that comes back to what's presumably kind of a common traditional tradition that's not literarily dependent on each other, but in other words, they're both preserving um, there's, uh, an earlier tradition, a tradition that's talking about this practice, even pre-Christian practice in the Jesus movement of mendicant apostles. So in Mark, it was no bread, no bag, no money, no second tunic, no looking for better accommodations, but yes, you can have staff and sandals. Yes, you're supposed to declare repentance and cast out demons and heal the sick. In Luke, there's no bag, there's no purse, which is more or less the same as no money. <coughs> Sorry. No sandals, no greeting people on the road, and no looking for better accommodations. You're supposed to eat what's given you, so that's kind of an, as opposed to saying no bring bread. In other words, you're eating what the people are giving you. And one of the things the message here is is sharing peace and also declaring the message: the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of God is at hand. And of course, yes, there's also the curing spiritual healing, curing sick people. There are additional attestations of this apostolic role. So the Gospel of Thomas, we've had a whole lecture on this. An important early witness has similar instructions for mendicant apostles attributed to Jesus in saying 14.4, where we read, when you go in any region and walk about in the countryside, when people take you in, eat what they serve you and heal the sick among them. So this again, he's saying this to the apostles and giving them this idea that they're to walk around as itinerants, they're mendicants, they're begging, you get, you eat what you um, are being provided, what the, other pe what the people are providing, and you are serving as a spiritual conduit, right? So you are, um, you are free from these worldly attachments, and as people are in need of spiritual healing, and even physical healing as they understand it, um, uh, you are that conduit for that. We have another really um, interesting and important uh, description from a text called the Didache. So the Didache is another really key early Christian text outside that has you know, been kept outside of the canon. Uh, so it's called the Teachings, it's subtitled The Teachings of the Twelve Apostles. So it dates from either the first or maybe the very early second centuries, and so therefore again one of the very early Christ, uh, earliest Christian writings. It includes um, some of the first descriptions of Christian institutions, things like sacraments and how they're to be, um, how you're to do them, so kind of rules, and so it's kind of a practical rule book and so on. Uh, things like priesthood, different kinds of roles and offices, including rules concerning apostles. And so in chapter 11, uh, it talks about apostles and prophets. So some of these early, um, in the Jesus movement, uh, with the way that the Jesus movement is understood, things that fall out in the later, in the second century. So these cease to be part of later Christianity. And so this is one of the ways we know this is an early description. So we read there, whosoever then, comes and teaches you all these things aforesaid, receive him. So they just have hold, had a whole list of what uh, doctrine should be. And so if they're teaching you that kind of doctrine, okay, receive them. But if the teacher himself be perverted and teach another doctrine to destroy these things, do not listen to him. But if his teaching be for the increase of righteousness and knowledge of the Lord, receive him as the Lord. And concerning the apostles and prophets, act thus according to the ordinance of the gospel. Let every apostle who comes to you be received as the Lord, but let him not stay more than one day, or if he need be, a second as well. But if he stays three days, he is a false prophet. And when an apostle goes forth, let him accept nothing but bread till he reach his night's lodging. But if he asks for money, he's a false prophet. 
Do not test or examine any prophet who is speaking in the Spirit, for every sin shall be given. This is quoting um, uh, from a saying of Jesus. Every sin from uh, every sin shall be forgiven, but this sin shall not be forgiven. But not everyone who speaks in the Spirit is a prophet, except he have the behavior of the Lord. From his behavior, then, the false prophet and the true prophet shall be known. And no prophet who orders a meal in the Spirit shall eat of it. Otherwise, he is a false prophet. And every prophet who teaches the truth, if he do not what he teaches, is a false prophet. But whoever, whosoever shall say in a Spirit, give me money <laughs> or something else, give me something else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tell you to give on behalf of others in want, let none judge him. So you can kind of see um, how this idea of uh, a tradition of wandering apostles and prophets, you can see on the one hand what they do, and you can also see by the time we're getting here to the, like I say, the late first century, the second generation of, uh, of what's now Christianity, um, they're, they're having to make rules for uh, people who are gaming the system, right? And so there is a lot of concern here with false prophets. And so false prophets are people who are asking for money, people who um, want to keep, who are not going to keep going around, who aren't going to go around and beg in other places, but they, they want to keep living with you after three days and so on. Um, people who are um, uh, preaching false doctrine as far as the uh, understanding of the Didache's understanding of doctrine is. So um, they have all of those kind of things as ways and rules to start regulating um, these mendicant apostles who are going around and continuing to speak in the spirit in this time. Um, but you can see, uh, you can kind of see on the one hand what they, what they would have been doing and also how some of the excesses can happen and why ultimately early Christianity decided to, to phase out this. And so ultimately as the, uh, as the communities become more established and they become led by, um, like say bishops who have authority over the community, when a prophet or an apostle wanders in uh, for a couple days and starts preaching all kinds of crazy things from the spirit and so forth, in a lot of cases maybe that don't seem like they're uh, uh, you know, in line with the doctrine as understood by the community, as regulated by the bishop and so on, you can see that at a certain point, the bishops aren't as interested in, in that, that kind of um, spirituality, kind of reckless, chaotic spirituality from the perspective of the institution. And so at that point, um, and as the, uh, this kind of piety evolves, um, the bishops are successful in getting um, uh, this kind of piety transferred into uh, the idea of monasteries. And so ultimately, if you are feeling this kind of spiritual connection, wouldn't it be better instead of wandering around and begging wouldn't it be better if you all lived in a monastery under the control of the bishop, <laughs> where you're not where you're not messing around with all of the the faithful in the congregations? So this is why ultimately the age of apostles ends, and of course there have been revivals. So I've met, talked about in a way how the Franciscans uh, and the Dominicans, both wandering mendicant orders who go around and again live by begging and so on, are out preaching. Um, they were. Um, a part of a great revival in the central middle ages of this kind of piety, but it was also um, very dangerous for the institutional church. They were able to co-opt those two, but some of the other uh, more radical mendicants who were preaching extreme poverty and things like that uh, were condemned as heretics from the church by the church who found them threatening. So, okay. Another characteristic of the original apostles does seem to be that they were both male and female. Um, we've talked before uh, that one of the characteristics of the Jesus movement, and some of its heirs anyway, in early Christianity, was inclusiveness of women, including in uh, major roles and leadership roles. So both women and men filled the role of apostle, and indeed the whole idea of sending apostles in pairs may have originated as a result of the need for um, uh, male and female pairings, and generally speaking, um, married couple apostles. Uh, and so, for example, whereas it would have been very possible for a single 
man in the uh, Greco-Roman world to go around traveling uh, and be a preacher, a mendicant preacher, and things like that. Uh, for a single unaccompanied woman or maybe even a pair of women, it was much less possible. Uh, women had to have essentially legal protection and even other protection. Uh, and so probably uh, in order to allow female disciples and apostles to travel through the Roman world legally, uh, the apostles were here would have been paired like that, male and female. So in, uh, this is described a little bit in, in by Paul when he himself is kind of uh, defending his claim to be called an apostle. Um, he's writing to uh, a community that he himself had founded, the Corinthians. Uh, the Corinthians have had connection with um, uh, apostles who have been uh, authorized by, um, uh, by people in James's group, the Jerusalem group, um, people who ha can trace their ties back to the historical Jesus. Um, Paul doesn't have that authorization connection. His source of authority, as he tells everybody all the time, is that he has had a vision of the risen Christ, um, he is not actually, um, he wasn't one of Jesus' apostles at the time, the historical Jesus' apostles. And so, and that, that made it so that people kind of wondered, well, wait a second, where, where is your authority coming from? And he had to sometimes uh, describe it and explain why he does things a little differently than some of the other apostles. And so he writes to them, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? So he's seen um, a vision of Christ. The risen Christ. Are you not my work in the Lord? In other words, I, I planted this community. You didn't exist. There was no church in Corinth uh, before um, I converted all of you. If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, since you are my converts, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to our food and drink? People are uh, giving the apostles food and drink. Do, not, do we not have the right as apostles? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? So he's asking, look, if you look at these other apostles from Jerusalem, the brothers of Jesus, like James and so on, who are leaders of this poor of Jerusalem community, Cephas, which is another name for Peter, uh, uh, they are all um, taking, accompanying uh, um, in their missionary journeys, they're being accompanied by a believing wife, right? Um, and, so, uh, and so Paul, even though his tradition is that he himself is doing it a little differently, he's traveling with male companions, he indicates that many of uh, the male apostles in the established community have wives as their companions. Um, Paul explicitly may address such a pair in his letter to the Romans, chapter 16. He says, Greeting Andromachus and Junica, my relatives who were in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So here he's talking to a couple in the Roman church, the relatives of, of Paul's, at least it's a man and a woman, Junia, and both of them are known as prominent apostles, according to Paul, and actually that they were Christians before Paul converted. So they're very early Christians indeed. And we also know from... Um, the gospel descriptions that Peter is depicted as having a wife as well. Um, so between, uh, between Paul's kind of description here about Cephas being accompanied by a believing wife and, and also um, the fact that Peter is described as being married and so forth in the, in the gospel accounts, we have this impression that uh, Peter and his wife may, be, may have been apostles together. So there's a bunch of other missionary pairings. Um, we, I'll just mention a couple of them here. Although not explicitly called apostles, another pair of married Christian missionaries were Priscilla and Aquila. They're mentioned four times in the New Testament. So Paul refers to them as fellow workers in Jesus Christ. And although, as we said, the historical Paul traveled with male companions, later tradition paired him with a female apostle named Thecla. Uh, and there's a whole apocryphal books of the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which is a really great um, 
Greco-Roman uh, romance novel, but not, I mean, not romance in the sense of uh, they're having a romance, but in the sense that it's an action adventure kind of story and so forth. Um, women speaking by the spirit. <coughs> As described in the Didache, part of the role of the apostle is to speak by the spirit. So there's an example of this type of practice from the Gospels that includes the prophet Anna, who testified by the Spirit as the infant Jesus was presented in the temple. And Luke, as Luke often does, pairs a male and a female pairing in terms of the uh, stories presented. And so Luke pairs Anna's prophecy in the temple with that of Simeon, a male uh, who is also speaking in the Spirit at the time Jesus is presented. So just with all of that then, and this is kind of a summary of the idea and role of apostles in the Jesus movement and the earliest Christianities. So apostles are men and women sent forth in pairs. They're mendicant, so they are begging for their food, and they are not to have more than you know, any of the barest minimum of property, and uh, they are not to take pay. They are to live on the believer's charity. And so there is a broader community who have not uh, done all of this renunciation of property, who are not um, sent forth, who are not apostles, but they are, um, uh, let's say, members of the Christian communities that are being visited and ministered to by the apostles. And they are also providing uh, the kind of the daily uh, living support for the apostles to be able to continue their work. When they are in places, one of the things the apostles are doing is prophesying by the Spirit. And so, again, they're a connection between the other world and the regular people who are ensconced in this world. They're also sharing the gospel. They're bringing good news. They're explicitly said to, the kingdom of heaven isn't at near. They're sharing the peace of Jesus. They're acting as spiritual healers. But... As the Didica says, they got to travel. If, if they spend more than two days in your house, they are a, a false prophet. They need to get out of there. <laughs> so, so move along. Uh, a mendicant, itinerant, um, you know, sort of proto monk uh, preachers. Okay, so now I want to look at having looked at what apostles are, I want to look at individual historical apostles. So, as we talked about, our earliest Christian author whose work survived Paul. He identifies himself as an apostle. So Paul is a known historical figure, and therefore he is a historical apostle in the early Christian period. And so are apostles and companions that he names. So in other words, we know Paul is a historical figure. We have many of his letters, are, are all scholars agree, are authentic and are written by him. He is talking to um, people, some of whom he calls apostles, like Adronicus and Junia, some of whom he talks about as companions that he is traveling with, like Barnabas and Aristarchus, Silas, Timothy, Epaphras, and Luke, etc. So in other words, in those kind of letters, we're going to have people who we can say pretty clearly are, um, you know, unless you don't believe a word that Paul says and you think that he's, I don't know, whatever. I mean, nobody believes that. So in other words, it's a, all historians conclude that those then would be historical apostle figures. Um, that is not going to be the same, is not going to be true, um, just because there are mentions in the, in the book of Acts, which is the second half of the book of the Gospel of Luke, or in the Gospels uh, alone. So just because um, you might be mentioned as a, a missionary companion, an apostolic companion of Paul in the book of Acts, and there's stories about it, the book of Acts is not um, not historical in the same way, right? So it is a, it is a um, scriptural document. It is written by an evangelist for an evangelical purpose, and it's not written by a historian. And just in the same way that the Gospels contain historical data that can be mined by historians, but are not uh, eyewitness accounts, the same is true for the book of Acts, which is the continuation of Luke. Okay. So what do we can we say you know, beyond Paul? So Paul didn't know the historical Jesus, as we say. So what can we say, though, about apostles who did know the historical Jesus? So in Galatians 2.9, Paul tells us that he personally met three apostles who'd known the historical Jesus. And these are James, the brother of Jesus, Cephas, which is Aramaic for rocky, 
Peter is Greek for the same, so this is a nickname uh, for a person whose birth name was Simon, so very the most famous of the apostles, the apostle Peter, and John, whom Paul identifies these three, James, Peter, and John, as, quote, the acknowledged pillars, is his term for that, the leaders of the church, the poor of Jerusalem, um, this central mendicant community uh, that Paul is uh, attempting to appease and to maybe get into good graces with, who he occasionally fights with because these um, leaders, especially James, are, are very much, view, they very much are of the belief that all members of Christianity need to be keeping a kind of Jewish law the way they do. So they have not um, come to this place that Paul has argued for, um, that Gentile converts, that non-Jewish converts into Christianity do not have to maintain the law because the law has been fulfilled in Christ. That's something that Paul is promoting, and uh, the Jerusalem group, which obviously has the historical connection to Jesus, uh, including familial connection, the actual brother, and so forth, the chief disciple Peter, um, they're they and Paul are not always uh, in agreement on this. Um, so Paul's testimony, though, that these historic apostles, uh, it, those, that's buttressed by multiple attestation and other early sources. We have for James, we saw how that's in Josephus. Now James, Peter, and John are in and so many other of their early texts. So that <clears throat> establishes those three fairly conclusively. So lacking other eyewitness accounts. So we have Paul, and Paul's a historic figure. He has met those guys as he testifies. The New Testament texts attributed to Jesus and the apostles aren't written by them, as we've seen in much of our lectures. So lacking other eyewitness accounts, pretty much every other name has to come with a degree of uncertainty, some stars, as we kind of say, well, maybe, maybe not, as the evidence uh, must be weighed on each case. So um, what about the rest of the 12? Is the idea of there being 12 apostles is that, or 12 special, set, a special subset of 12, is that even historic? So Paul does confirm um, the 12 existed, certainly early on in uh, early Christianity, and presumably, therefore, back to uh, the time of Jesus, since it's not something that is maintained in later Christianity. So Paul writes again to the Corinthians, I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then this is the part where we, we kind of see um, the beginnings of um, going from the Jesus movement to uh, earliest kinds of Christianity. So the risen Christ appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So there's a lot of groups here that are having experiences with the risen Christ, right? So he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, and then he appeared to James, than to all the apostles. So Paul here is making a distinction between the 12 and all the apostles. And although elsewhere in his account of the Jerusalem church, James takes precedence over Cephas, Peter, uh, Paul associates Cephas with the 12 and James with all the other apostles. And indeed that quotation, I've, I've used it in a bunch of different um, lectures and sermons and so forth. Uh, uh, that kerygma, as it's called, most scholars believe that Paul here is passing on a kind of a pre-Christian or I'm sorry, pre-Pauline testimony that even predates him. So uh, this is an understanding that the earliest Christians have of how they are experiencing the risen Christ. Okay, and so what then was the historical Jesus's purpose? of setting Peter and the Twelve apart from all of these other apostles that we're hearing about that we see this uh, role of. In other words, we have a role of uh, what regular apostles are about. What's the role of the Twelve? 
So Paul doesn't really give us any further information about the Twelve, and so among our earliest understandings of the Twelve's purpose is found in that lost Q saying source, but in parts that are preserved in Matthew and Luke variants. And so this is a very, again, early source. So in Matthew 19 we read, Peter said in reply, look, we have left, he's talking to Jesus, look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, to the 12, truly I tell you, as the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And so here's Luke's version of that. So in Luke 22, we read, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in trials, and I confer on you just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel." So, so between these two, the historical Jesus seems to have called twelve individuals to serve as sort of judges for a spiritually renewed twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel hadn't existed um, since all the way back to uh, the destruction of the northern kingdoms. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians, so even way before the destruction of the, the first destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. Um, but anyway, now there is an understanding of a restored spiritual Israel here, and Jesus has 12 um, individuals among his disciples, 12 apostles, who are sort of stand-ins for those tribes. So understood through the ap apocalyptic lens of the Q saying source, um, these 12 are to fulfill a role in Judgment Day, judging the 12 tribes uh, on thrones and so forth. However, it's also possible we could speculate that the 12 symbolically might represent for Jesus a new spiritual Israel. Um, so that's if you didn't, uh, if it was being understood without the kind of lens of apocalypticism that we find in Q. It's sort of speculative, but in any event, this is an, uh, we don't have too much idea of what the actual purpose of the 12 is. So who were the 12? The first list we have of the 12 by name comes from our earliest surviving gospel, Mark. And we read in Mark chapter three, Jesus went up to the mountain, sorry, Jesus went up the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted and they came to him. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. So he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. And, and by the way, the name Peter really sticks, but this name Boanerges does not stick. It only exists here in, in, um, in Matthew, so even in, I'm sorry, in Mark. So even though... Um, uh, James and John um, are, end up being uh, major, major figures. That nickname doesn't stick with them. Anyway, but continuing on. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And so um, that's Mark's list, the earliest list. And since Mark is a source for uh, Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke both had access to that. They used that list. They edited it the way they each liked to edit Mark. Uh, and then there's also uh, not a list, but there are some of these characters developed in the Gospel of John uh, with even more, though, variations than what the variations are between Matthew and Luke from Mark. So just quickly, I made a little bit of a chart here. 
um, of the lists of the 12 that we kind of have in the Gospels, They're listed anyway in Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark, Matthew. There's a list in Luke and there's a list in Acts, but they're quite similar to the two lists because uh, Luke and Acts are two halves of the same book. And then I have apostles as kind of seen here in John. And each one of these in this chart, in these of 12, is going from uh, at the top, the best attested all the way down to the least, right? And so at the top, we have Mark calls Simon, who is given the name Peter, and that's, that's the way he's also referred to in Matthew and Luke. Uh, in the Gospel of John, he's called Simon Peter, and some places else he's called Cephas, just the way um, Paul calls him Cephas and so forth. Then we have John, and we've had in, in Mark here, uh, this Boanerges, uh, Sons of Thunder nickname that, um, that he, uh, Jesus gives him according to Mark. So John. In Matthew, that nickname is not preserved, and instead he's just referred to as John, the son of Zebedee. It's called John in the book of Luke and Acts. And in the Gospel of John, um, the sons of Zebedee are, are both are, are called, so-called anyway, the two sons of Zebedee, but they aren't individually named, so we're not hearing John's name. Um, we'll talk about uh, John and the beloved disciple and the Gospel of John, the confusion there, uh, when we get to John. Anyway, the second one is James, which is to say John's brother, also son of Zebedee, and so forth. The next most uh, well-established one is Judas Iscariot. As Mark said, the one who portrays him, um, that continues to be existing in both Matthew and carried over in Luke. In Acts, of course, he's dead, and so um, they talk about at the beginning of Acts that uh, Judas is replaced by a guy named Matthias, of whom we know nothing else. He's called Judas, son of Simon Iscariot in the Gospel of John. Then we have the Thomas. It's called Thomas and Thomas. It's also known as Didymus, according to the Gospel of John. Thomas is the um, Aramaic word for twin, and Didymus is the Greek word for twin. So um, sometimes it's called Thomas the twin as a result of that. We have Andrew, who is Peter's brother. Uh, and then we have Philip, who's at least attested in all four of these Gospels. And then Simon the Canaanian, who Matthew ch changes, uh, corrects the name and calls him Simon the Canaanite. Luke uh, gets rid of this whole Canaanian thing and calls him Simon the Zealot. Doesn't appear in John. Uh, Mark lists a guy named Matthew. Uh, he also has a story about, who not an apostle, of Levi the publican. Matthew, uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew, changes the name of Levi the publican, and so as a result, people have conflated Matthew and Matthew the publican, and that happens in Matthew. Again, Luke just continues to call that one Matthew. Um, there's my, that, that chart is wrong there. <laughs> so it's not, that should be not, fi not figuring into John. It's not Simon Peter, so it's anyway. So it's, in other words, not, Matthew doesn't exist in the John Gospel. So then uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, James, the son of Alphaeus, again, not in John. Bartholomew, it's not in John. There's a, instead, there is a guy named Nathaniel that gets conflated with Bartholomew. And then Thaddeus, uh, the last of Mark's uh, least attested, is continued in Matthew, but Luke um, replaces him with a guy named Judas, son of James. And people equate that Judas, the Apostle Judas, with somebody in an apostle in the Gospel of John who is called Judas, but obviously not the Iscariot. So, uh, there's two Judases in, in, in Luke's and uh, John's list, but you have to differentiate between essentially Judas the bad and Judas not the bad. <laughs> All right, so I want to look at each one of these um, in a little bit of detail so that we can kind of uh, let's talk about which of these, you know, do we can we say have any kind of real historic basis and which really don't. And so at that bottom of the list where we just have names, um, whether whether the names have any historicity, you know, is is very very debatable, and in any event, since nothing historical is known about any of them, it, it's pretty much irrelevant. So at the bottom of the list, we really just have names, and so Thaddeus, uh, Mark's list includes Thaddeus and Matthew. Following Mark, I'm sorry, Mark's list includes Thaddeus, and then the Gospel of Matthew follows that with Mark. But Luke, as I said, replaces the name Thaddeus with somebody who's called. 
Jude of James or Judas of James. And there's also, as I said, an apparent apostle in the Gospel of John who is called Judas, but not Judas the Iscariot. So, like I say, later tradition then kind of wrongly conflates all of these, and so they kind of creates a conglomerated character called Jude Thaddeus, the brother of Jesus, by also even included by conflating even the character from the book of Jude, who is Jude the brother of James, and James is the brother of Jesus, and so therefore Jude Thaddeus becomes brother of Jesus and so forth. Okay, so what about Thaddeus. So later tradition that doesn't again have any historical basis imagined that Thaddeus preached in Syria and then Mesopotamia and Libya before facing martyrdom in Beirut. So along with another very obscure apostle Bartholomew, he has become the patron of the Armenian Apostolic Church. The Armenian Church um, traditionally understands itself to be uh, the very first of the na national Christian churches predating uh, Constantine's conversion and so forth. Uh, and it's certainly right around the same time. So it is a very old and ancient uh, Christian tradition. And so the fact that they've kind of claimed, let's say the two most obscure apostles is uh, way less hubristic than the people off in Compostela did <laughs> when, they, when they went and got James the Greater. Um, so his remains are either supposedly in Armenia or they're in the Vatican where there is a shrine uh, uh, where Thaddeus is said to be buried with another apostle together in the same kind of uh, shrine, Simon the Zealot, who we'll look at later. Okay, so that's the least. And the next one's also still just a name, Bartholomew the Apostle. There's really no biblical stories for Bartholomew. His name means son of Talmai. So if you think of Simon Bar Jonah, that means like the bar here is the um, Aramaic for son of the Hebrew is Ben, right? So if you're, and and the Arabic is Ibn, so you can kind of see the all of these um, the patronymic here for the related Semitic languages of Aramaic, Hebrew, and Arabic. We we're pretty used to having people be named, um, you know, Ben Gurion or Ibn. Khaldun, you know, and all these different, you know, for the Arabic names. And anyway, Bar is the Aramaic one. So, and we have a lot of names like Bartholomew, where, where the Bar is like that. So, Bar, son of Talmai. He's conflated, as I said, with Nathaniel, who is a character in John's Gospel, Nathaniel of Cana. Later tradition assigns him a mission to Armenia, India, and sometimes to Arabia and Ethiopia. His body is supposedly in Benevento, Italy. Although uh, uh, the cathedral in Frankfurt, Germany, thinks that they have a part of his skull at least, and apparently one of his arms is in Canterbury, England. So anyway, people were very interested in getting relics of various apostles if they could in the Middle Ages. Okay, the next one, still just a name here too. James, the son of Alphaeus, and who's sometimes called James the Less, but also uh, James the Less is actually also a named character uh, in the um, New Testament, who is presumably a different character, actually. So it's pretty amazing if you actually make it on the list of Jesus's 12 apostles, and you're still primarily known for being less than another apostle named James, but because there are so many Jacobs in uh, the New Testament, Jameses and Marys, you have to really try to figure out uh, which James or which Mary you're talking about. So even though... Um, uh, this apostle is known as James the Less. Like I say, that's a conflation. So the apostle James, son of Alphaeus, is traditionally identified with this other James. And this is a guy who's called in the Gospel of Mark, James the Younger, and it's been translated James the Less. And that guy is only mentioned because they use him to identify uh, a disciple named Mary. And because there are so many Marys uh, who actually often all get conflated or many of them which get conflated in the New Testament, this Mary is always identified as being Mary the mother of James the Less in order to differentiate her from the other Marys. So in other words, James the Less is not an important figure. Uh, it's, it's this Mary the mother of James the Less that is. And then um, there's no particular reason, and when, in fact, we shouldn't identify a him with uh, James, son of Alphaeus, who is a different, diff just simply a different James. 
So what about these guys, these two guys? So like Thaddeus and Bartholomew, James the son of Alphaeus is just a name with no biblical stories. Mark also talks about a publican, a tax collector named Levi, who is also said to be son of Alphaeus. And since Alphaeus is a rarer name, it's completely possible here that, uh, that James and Levi are brothers. And then because the Levi story is conflated in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew changes Levi's name to Matthew, um, James is then, I'm sorry, Matthew is conflated with Levi the publican, and so then James is somehow thought to be Matthew's brother. Um, but that last association is, uh, you know, again, no good. So later tradition puts uh, James's ministry in Egypt, and it says that he was crucified in the town of Ostrakine. So Matthew, as we're rounding out here, the, um, the, the names of the apostles of whom we know the least. So even though the name Matthew is um, very famous because of the gospel of Matthew, the evangelist is who's actually famous, um, the original Matthew on Mark's list is neither a publican, a tax collector, nor is he an evangelist. He's just an anonymous name, essentially, not anonymous, but anyway, just an, a name about which nothing is known on Mark's story. The author, as I say, of the gospel attributed to Matthew changed the name of a character in Mark, uh, and thus Matthew became connected with this idea of Levi, the publican, son of Alphaeus. And then later tradition conflated Matthew the publican with Matthew the apostle, and then wrongly identified him as the author of the Gospel of Matthew, which is why Matthew seems like such an important um, apostle that he shouldn't be so low on this list right here. So the Gospel of Matthew, though, I'm sorry, the Gospel attributed to Matthew was an anonymous text written by a Jewish Christian around the year 80 or 90 of the first century. The superscription, uh, according to Matthew, was added to the manuscripts sometime in the second century AD. However, there was a statement by uh, a very early bishop in Egypt, Papias, in around the year 125, and because his, of the statement that he made, that um, where essentially he claimed that Matthew arranged the sayings of Jesus in Aramaic first, um, this has led, whatever Papias means, it has nothing to do with the text that we now call the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and so, uh, it, though, because people wrongly assumed that it did, the Gospel of Matthew, we can say for sure, um, does not, it was not originally written in Aramaic and then translated in Greek. It is originally written in Greek, so it is not what Papias is talking about. And so, therefore, all of the ideas that people have um, about Matthew being the first gospel, or Matthew being originally written in Greek. Matthew is not the first. Matthew is working from Mark and so forth. Um, we just have to ignore um, this statement by Pap Papias, who, which has really confused people for up, up to the present day even. So anyway, so Matthew, um, the evangelist, the apostle, this conflation character, uh, he's supposedly buried in uh, this magnificent uh, Norman Cathedral built by uh, Robert Giscard in southern Italy in, in the city of Salerno. Okay, so as we're looking at the 12 here, I've now knocked off the bottom four, which is to say the least um, known of the four and the ones for whom they're really just names that uh, Mark could have, you know, made up for all we know, because there's really no traditions attached to them. Um, that are that are in the gospel stories or anything before that. There's traditions that get attached to them after that, uh, but anyway, that don't have uh, much historical basis, these later traditions. Okay, the next one up the list, Simon the Canaanite Zealot. So Mark anachronistically calls this Simon to differentiate him from Simon called Peter. He calls him a Canaanian, which Matthew corrects to Canaanite. So it's anachronistic because, um, you know, if Mark is sitting around reading uh, the Old Testament, the Greek Septuagint, um, there is a big, long series of fights between Canaanites and Israelites. But that term, Canaanite, is no longer, you know, present and in use, um, you know, which is why some of the other Gospels will say things like, 
Syrio-Phoenician, which is to say local um, Semitic speaking peoples uh, of kind of the lesser Syria area that, and Phoenicia area that are not um, adherents to Judaism. So they're, uh, you know, and are not Samaritans. So those are the kind of, uh, anyway, what that, what that kind of would mean. But anyway, Mark is calling that Canaanian here. So Luke changes that, just gets rid of that altogether, and calls him Simon the Zealot, um, referring to a, um, one of the kind of sects within um, Judaism, uh, the Zealots. So while, um, again, this Simon has no biblical stories, um, he does make his way into um, some of the Apocrypha, and one of them in particular, kind of a fun uh, book of Apocrypha, is uh, an Arabic infancy gospel where Simon is a child who's been bitten by a snake, and then Jesus, as a boy, um, heals him uh, of the poisonous snake bite, and then goes on to predict Simon's future discipleship. So later tradition has Simon sent around various locations in the Middle East, North Africa, Spain, even all the way to Britain, uh, before being martyred by being sawed a half in half, either in Persia or Georgia. There's a lot of gruesome iconography of this. Um, there, at a certain point, um, became all the kinds of different ways that the each of the apostles were facing martyrdom. So Jesus is crucified, but many others are either in this case, sawed in half or beheaded or crucified in weird ways, upside down or sideways and so forth. So other traditions, though, um, have him crucified. So while he was serving as a bishop of Jerusalem or uh, dying peacefully in the city of Edessa in Mesopotamia or Syria, um, his remains are supposedly at this point in a monastery in Mount Athos in Greece. Okay, so going up to the next one of these. Philip the Apostle. So with Philip, we actually come to the first of the apostles who have New Testament stories. Um, so he's not, even though he's on the list in the Synoptic Gospels, there's not Synoptic stories. But um, John's Gospel states that he's from Bethsaida, which is the same uh, town in Galilee that Andrew and Peter are from. He attends the wedding feast at Cana. He, uh, he's at the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus asks him, how, is he gonna, how are we going to feed the 5,000? He's also at the Last Supper, and at the Last Supper, Philip asks Jesus to show, him the fa- to show them, to show all the disciples the Father. Um, nevertheless, uh, scholars identify John as probably the least historical of the Gospels and the most literary. And in almost all of these cases, um, Philip's role is pretty literary. So, you know, he's asking Jesus a question about showing us the Father so that Jesus can, that sets up a, um, a teaching that Jesus is going to have that explains um, the connection between Jesus and God, right? Uh, and, so, um, and so in that sense, it's, it's part of the literary creation of the Gospel of John and not so much, we can't actually even find out so much about Philip here. However, he did is the source of lots of later legends and he figures into apocryphal texts, including there's a second century letter from Peter to Philip and a fourth century Gnostic Gospel that purports to tell uh, the acts of Philip. And during this, um, these acts, which are again kind of uh, exciting and, and, and so on. He gets into a, a magic duel with the sorcerers of Pharaoh, of all things. I mean, you can imagine there are no pharaohs in, in the Christian age anymore, but nevertheless, uh, the Pharaoh and his sorcerers had been part of the Old Testament story, and the Old Testament serves as a source for many Christian texts. And so he gets in this duel with the sorcerers before getting himself beheaded, and other traditions have him crucified sideways or upside down. His remains are also supposedly in Rome in the Basilica of the Santi Apostoli, but another tradition has a tomb of his in Hierapolis, Turkey. So now moving up the rung to ones that are better known, Peter's brother, Andrew the Apostle. Andrew um, is known pretty much only as the brother of Simon and to Peter. So he figures into the story of Peter being called uh, to being apostle as he's uh, right there with Peter and goes along with him. So the brothers are fishermen from the town of Bethsaida in Galilee, 
And so Galilee, we kind of opt to note, is kind of a mixed region. So some of the people there are practicing Jews who speak Aramaic. Some of the people, though, are Greek speakers, uh, and others are uh, Aramaic speakers who you know, are, are, are of the old gods and so forth that are not uh, practicing Jews. And that's also um, Samaritans nearby to the south of them. So the fact that it's such a cosmopolitan, some of the cities anyway there would have been Greek cosmopolitan cities, but the fact that it's such a mixed region is highlighted by the fact that Andrew's name very unusually is Greek. So not Hebrew like his brother Simon's name. Um, and so Anyway, the family, at least, for some reason, you know, is picking names from uh, both of the languages and traditions. So Jesus calls the brothers from their fishing nets, saying in Mark 1, 17, rather than being fishermen, I will make you fishers of men. He's going to make them apostles and missionaries that are um, um, bringing people into the, into the community. So in the rest of the Gospels, Andrew pretty much fades into the background as Peter takes the spotlight. But he nevertheless inspired an apocryphal gospel, an apocryphal book of Acts. Unfortunately, both of those were declared heretical, and as with so many heretical texts, uh, they were burned and lost, and so we don't actually know uh, what they, uh, we don't have the texts of those. But later traditions find Andrew running around in Georgia and Malta and Cyprus, across Slavic lands, and even all the way to Scotland. And his remains are actually pretty much everywhere from Greece to Poland to Scotland. Um, and his uh, legendary crucifixion on a kind of a X kind of cross um, is what inspires the cross of St. Andrew, if you know the flag of Scotland, which is a blue field with a white X across it that forms part of the, um, the British Union Jack, which combines the cross of St. George, uh, the cross of St. Andrew, and uh, an invented but anyway, cross of St. Patrick in order to have a union between England, uh, Scotland, and Ireland in the flag, Northern Ireland. So Thomas the Apostle, getting up now to uh, ones, uh, again, apostles who have more stories and even more, more and more fleshed out stories in the New Testament. Thomas, as I said, means twin in Aramaic, and he's also called Didymus, which is a word for twin in Greek. So he's known as the apostle in John who initially doubts that Jesus has been resurrected. So he's often called Doubting Thomas. And so um, as we talked about in our uh, lecture on the Gospel of Thomas, this may reflect something that the community, it's sometimes called the Johannine community, the community that is creating um, the texts that become known as the Gospels of John and the Epistles of John and so forth, they may be disagreeing with ideas held by other Christian communities that claim Thomas as their authority. So sometimes what you do, you know, with rivals, rivals say, well, I'm doing this, but the authority of Peter and so forth. Well, then you make a story where Peter um, denies Christ or so on. In other words, where, he's, where Peter is taken down a peg and so forth. Um, and that may well be a story that goes all the way back, but I'm just using that as an example. In the same way, uh, Thomas doubts the resurrection, and maybe that's casting um, aspersions on Christian, other Christian communities that are, are, are claiming to act in Thomas's authority. So there were several that are doing that because we have, uh, in addition to the Gospel of Thomas, there's also uh, an infancy gospel attributed to Thomas too. So the sayings gospel, though, attributed to, to Thomas uh, that exists. We have a little bit of it. It's originally in Greek, and we have a little bit of it in Greek, but we have most of the text preserved in Coptic uh, that was rediscovered in Egypt at the Nag Hammadi uh, Library, buried library. It's really among the most important Christian texts that are outside the canon. In its present form, the Gospel of Thomas, and we've had a lecture on this, it begins, these are the hidden words that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas wrote them down. So, um, so Thomas is, uh, at least by the, in the, the authority that the community um, that compiled the Gospel of Thomas in its, the latest form that we have it, uh, in any way, and put that saying at the beginning of it and attributed the Gospel to that. So, as I say, um, the Gnostic Christians uh, that were uh, 
ha that owned that library, even if the even if Thomas, whether or not Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Thomas as we have it, is a Gnostic or just simply a proto-Gnostic text, it was popular with people who were interested in Gnosticism in general, and Gnostic Christians continued to um, have Thomas as one of the uh, figures that uh, they were in favor of. They didn't like Peter. Uh, they do like Thomas and Mary Magdalene and so forth. And as they later understood it and, and kind of their um, uh, mythology increased about what, who Thomas was, they sort of understood Thomas to be the twin of Jesus and very much akin to um, kind of these Hellenistic uh, stories of, of, of divine human pairings of twins. So Castor and Pollux, so one of them is a god and the other one is mortal. And uh, same thing, Hercules has a, uh, has a mortal twin and so forth. There's these kind of pairings. And so Thomas is just like Jesus, except for he's the mortal one and, and Jesus is, is uh, the God, the divine one. So uh, in addition to being um, adopted by the Gnostic community, um, there are associations with Thomas all across the East, a mission to the East, and especially in India. Uh, in India, in the province of Kerala, in southwest India, there's a home to a very ancient Christian community. Um, we, have, we have sources for it that go may, may be dated all the way back to the third century. Um, they're to this day now known as St. Thomas Christians. They have associations with the churches of the East, you know, which are even you know, the churches that are further East than Eastern Orthodox and so on, although they are now their own uh, independent community. So the the adherents there in Kerala definitely believe that Thomas himself was their founder, and 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 I you know can at least say that just like with even even more that's even a more ancient association than Santiago has, and it's certainly a very ancient tradition, even if it's very very unlikely. It's not even if it's not history. So that takes us all the way up through, like I say, the lowest ones of these that are that are least known, uh, that we have just more or less have names, to the middle bracket where we have names and stories. And it really brings us to the last four, the ones that we know the most about uh, and have the most stories about Judas Iscariot, uh, James the son of Zebedee, John the son of Zebedee, and Simon Peter. So Judas Iscariot um, is an interesting one, of course, because G Judas is the bad guy. Judas is the one who betrays Jesus, and um, he is that way already in the, um, in the very first list. So even as we read the list in Mark, we have it, the very last one named is Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed uh, Jesus. And, um, and Jesus is also very clearly... Um, Judas, as a betrayer, is also very clearly um, embedded in the Passion narrative. So as they're having the Last Supper, and Jesus is saying, one of you, one of you is going to betray me, one of the twelve here, it is definitely within the context of understanding one of the twelve, and specifically um, Judas as, uh, as, uh, as a betrayer and as being part of the twelve. And there is also um, a very early, so that's very early, it's um, associating with the 12 in both the Mark and Passion narrative, which is the earliest Passion narrative we have, but that is also found in the, uh, the Passion narrative that we have in the Gospel of John. And it's uh, two of those, it's one of, the, one of the still outstanding kind of problems or, conf uh, or uh, issues that we have as we are understanding uh, the Christian tradition, the synoptics are uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, are, are so together on everything that we had to explain literary dependency, whereas most of the Gospel of John is just crazily different from all three of those until you get to the very end. And then suddenly in the Passion narrative, so many elements overlap, uh, including uh, ideas with Judas and so forth. Uh, and so again, it seems to be um, early. Many scholars posit that there is a... Um, a pre-Mark and Passion source that's lost that Mark is using as the source for the Passion and that also uh, maybe the author of John has that as well. Um, in any event, it does seem like Judas and the betrayal are very early. It's also, um, 
It's also seemingly in Paul as another, another level of attestation because Paul, um, when he's talking about uh, the institution of uh, communion as a sacrament, uh, he talks about Jesus uh, in doing this on the night uh, that he was handed over. Um, and so the implication is, again, that there was the, that this uh, handed over to the Romans and betrayed and so forth. Uh, and, so, and so we have what is, what is uh, kind of an early multi-attested tradition with Judas. Um, and then we can also tell, for example, in the same way in that synoptic problem, uh, that Luke and Matthew, the authors of Luke and Matthew, are working for Mark as their source. Mark doesn't uh, conclude the story. You know, there's not a, it's not a um, happy ending where, where the traitor uh, gets his uh, desserts and so forth. And so both Matthew and Luke create death stories um, for Judas. In the one, uh, he hangs himself, and in the other, uh, he has an accident and uh, in a, and uh, has a, is, is disemboweled. And because they're totally contradictory, um, it also you know it's, it also shows anybody who wants to read uh, uh, the Bible as an errant literalistic history and not uh, as as it has the trouble of it's internally contradictory. The two t- stories are are not reconcilable, although people try. Um, and so then Judas will just say one more thing in terms of the a- extra legends. Um, he, he does have uh, his own gospel, a Gnostic gospel, where um, different Christians have decided, well, he's, he's been misunderstood and, and give him uh, his own perspective as well. We already talked a little bit about James the Great because we started this off by talking about Santiago and uh, the later tradition that uh, at a certain point he's uh, whisked away by the angels in a rudderless boat and makes his way all the way to Galicia. Um, uh, what, he's definitely one of the um, apostles that figures into the synoptic narrative a lot. And so there is a pairing that Mark has of Peter, James, and John. Uh, and James and John, in Mark's understanding, are uh, brothers with each other. And he gives them even uh, this uh, nickname, uh, the same way that Peter has a nickname, although it's a nickname that doesn't stick. So the Sons of Thunder. Uh, he doesn't explain, I guess, why that why that should be, but he pairs them together. And so this particular image is um, the uh, event of the Transfiguration uh, G- uh, vision. Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. Uh, he's transfigured before them, and they see him in glory, along with uh, the vision of Elijah and a vision of Moses and so on. Um, so the question I have, though, and I think that this is one of these coincidences that exists because there's so many of these guys named James. And as remember, that's really Jacob, right? But there's so many people named James. And so we have, if Mark, in order to get his... Um, some of his narrative, is a familiar with Paul and has been reading Paul. If you remember that the acknowledged pillars of the church that Paul puts together are Peter, James, and John. But it's not James the Great in Paul. In Paul, as remember, it's James the brother of Jesus, not James the brother of John. But I always wonder if um, perhaps in writing his version of the story, we aren't having a situation with Mark where he is at odds with this group, the poor of Jerusalem. He doesn't. Um, he wants to discount uh, their authority as they have been led by James, the brother of Jesus, and also by Jude, the brother of James, the brother of Jesus. And so I wonder if. Paul, if Mark here, the author of Mark, is deliberately replacing um, as one of the central pillars one James with a different James and has therefore elevated a character here, uh, the brother of John. So made another character, the son of Zebedee. Anyway, that's my speculation. We, it's, it, it's really hard to, um, it, it's just an interesting thing that there are, there are this Peter, James, and John connection that is in Paul, but is maintained as a very different thing. We also have in Mark um, many instances where Jesus' brothers uh, 
you know, think that he's crazy, <laughs> they are not followers and so forth, even though we know uh, from the other sources that they are his followers at some point or other. So, so Mark does seem to be trying to um, disparage anyway uh, Jesus' brothers. Uh, next, John the Beloved, John, what's known as John the Beloved, uh, actually John and the Beloved. So as we saw from Paul, this is one of the characters that we know is a historical figure. This is somebody that Paul met, one of the acknowledged pillars of the Church of Jerusalem. But as with so many characters, this also becomes a bunch of conflated figures. And so we've had a whole lecture, for example, on the Signs Gospel, where we talk about some of the issues of the authorship of the Gospel attributed to John. Uh, once again, it's an anonymous text. It's actually written in multiple stages. Um, there's at least two, because the seams are so very obvious, and so there is a final uh, redactor editor who is actually not anywhere near as good as the middle writer. And there may well be then an interior text. We've talked about the science gospel that may well be the first or original component of that text. Um, none of these are um, said to be written by in the, within the text by anybody named John. There is a place in the text where it says, um, we, we are able to, uh, we are saying all these things because of the testimony uh, of the beloved disciple. But in fact, the beloved disciple as a character, who's a character throughout uh, the Gospel of John, is not named and is not named John. That is a later um, attribution and association. And so um, the character in the Gospel of John, the beloved disciple, um, there's no the connection or the conflation with that character and the historical figure John hasn't, isn't particularly warranted at all. And so this is a connection. There's way less warranted connections to, for example, conflating John the, uh, the Revelator, John the Apocalypticist, uh, the author of the book of Revelation, who is very clearly another guy named John who doesn't even pretend to be uh, or write anything like the kind of Greek that is in the, uh, the Gospel of John or the letters attributed to John. So in other words, these are all different people, some of whom are named John, some aren't. So the guy, John, the revelator, John of Patmos, is named John, but he's just a different guy. Um, but uh, what we could say then about John the Beloved is um, there was a historical figure. There is also a character uh, uh, of the Beloved Disciple. These are wedged together, and um, there becomes a community that acts in John's name, the Johannine community, and then they have a tradition that uh, John was the, one of the youngest disciples and lived uh, very long. But again, this doesn't, um, we're conflating a lot of things together to make that, and it doesn't have as much, it's some history, there's some hints to that, but, and again, is one of the most attested disciple, up disciples. There is a historical figure here at the root, but what all of the characteristics we can't necessarily say. And that leads us to, finally, the most known and most attested of all of the apostles, guy who was born, Simon, uh, who got his name changed to the rock or Rocky by Jesus, um, who is somebody who continues to be one of the leaders of the early Christian community, who meets uh, with Paul several times. Um, he is uh, engaged in, um, we know that he's engaged in these apostolic uh, kind of missionary journey plantings that uh, that Paul is also engaged in because Paul talks about him being uh, active in Antioch, which is the Roman capital of Syria. And there is, although we don't have um, as much of the, um, let's say, contemporary evidence as we would like, there's ideas that are fairly early that he's martyred, and there's some hints that it could be in Rome the way Christian tradition uh, has it. And so later Christian tradition has him uh, have his martyrdom on the Vatican Hill. And then ultimately, retroactively, he's understood to have been the first bishop of Rome, the first pope of Rome. And people even think that they have, like, again, his tomb, because they found a very ancient tomb that is attributed to him. Um, but again, 
just we also have a very ancient tomb that's attributed to Jesus and so forth. In other words, if it just gets back to uh, within 200 years, it's still not close enough to have it be the actual tomb. Um, but in any event, there was definitely a Peter. He is definitely uh, very important in the early part of this movement. Um, but all the rest of the characteristics of what we can say on him is we, we have to, um, in a way, within in the light of all of the, the later tradition. And so that's the <laughs> my, kind of my overview of what we can know, and then also some of the traditions that developed afterwards um, that continued to be celebrated and, and lived out in the lives of uh, Christians locally all over the place, where everywhere from Salerno to uh, uh, St. Andrews, Scotland, people have um, their own traditional anyway, and to, to India. People have their own traditional um, associations of apostolic founders and so forth. Um, the one other uh, apostolic figures uh, that I wanted to mention, um, who which we've had uh, a whole lecture on, uh, potentially apostolic, is uh, Jesus's disciple Mary Magdalene. Um, and so it, especially in um, some of the later Christian traditions, the Gnostics and so forth, they um, see Mary Magdalene definitely as being one of the apostles, uh, hanging out with uh, the 12, if not part of the 12, as we saw, apostles can be female and male. Um, and, the, and at least later, because she's such an important figure in the canonical stories, you know, there's later gospels attributed to Mary Magdalene and so forth. So at least later, she is understood to be part of that apostolic group. Um, from what we have in the canonical gospels, it's not as clear if that's the role that she has, because I think that there's also another very important um, role in early Christianity and one that was often held by um, uh, women, and it was even in Paul's time too, where wealthy women who are interested in the spiritual movement are the kind of, um, let's say, backers who are able to support these mendicants and so forth. And so that is described, and Mary Magdalene is described as being like one of these women in the Gospel of Luke. And so that would be the other possibility. So either Mary Magdalene is emblematic of um, w women that are, are able to be, uh, let's say, wealthier supporters of the movement who are doing that, or she may actually represent one who is uh, who is more like an actual disciple uh, of Jesus who is functionally and maybe even did uh, operate as one of the apostles, not the 12. And so that is my survey of, um, of apostles, the 12, their historicity, what we can know of them, what the role was about in antiquity and the earliest uh, part of the Jesus movement and then in early Christianity, and also why apostles uh, were phased out by the church as it developed as an institution. And so with that, I think um, if Leandro um, start seeing if there's been questions that people have had or comments. <laughs> yeah, well, I, there's, a, there's a lot of apostles. And so once I started going down the list, I'm like, oh, this is going to take forever. <laughs> you know, to do 12. <laughs> Get a glass of water here. So Bob Garrison asks. Oh, okay, let me have the mouse here. Thank you. Bob Garrison asks: Are the relics in the Catholic churches today all authentic? And so, no. <laughs> the answer is no. So as people have uh, made made uh, have mentioned, even in the Middle Ages, they know, people have noted there are so many. Um, parts of the true cross, for example, relics of the true cross, that you could build Noah's Ark out of how much wood you would have if you would put it all together. So in other words, they can't all be authentic. There are, um, there are multiple heads of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was beheaded. And so um, it's not possible for all of them to be authentic. There are, are when I'm mentioning that um, the different remains, uh, in addition, you know, so we mentioned how um, the Venetians say they've got the body of, of St. Mark uh, in their, in St. Mark's uh, Basilica in Venice. Well, the, 
the, um, the patriarch, the Pope of the Coptic Orthodox uh, Church in Alexandria, Egypt, they also say that they have the body of Mark still. They say that the, the um, Phoenicians did not steal it or th only thought they did or they got tricked and stole the wrong body or whatever. <laughs> and so, and so if you, you can't, they can't all be authentic because of, um, there's multiple overlapping claims. And, and, and indeed, most of these do not go back at all to antiquity. They're almost, so they're, they're usually ancient traditions. In other words, where they go back to the Middle Ages, um, but they are, they, they are not usually going back. None of them go back to New Testament times. So none of the ones, there are no authentic relics from the New Testament. Uh, in terms of, um, there are some ancient Christian martyrs. So they, Christians preserved um, uh, bodies of martyrs from even you know the second and third centuries, and so there are going to be authentic, but ones. But those are names that um, that we don't know as much. You know, so later you get more interested if the person is a a named figure, like I say in the New Testament. Um, it may well be that you know that that the relics and the body of Saint Cuthbert in Britain, if those are that really is Saint Cuthbert, and so forth. Um, but it's the ones that when you say, well, is this really the the head of John the Baptist? And the answer is no. Um, so Stephanie Seresi says, why doesn't anyone think that the disciple Jesus loved the author of the Gospel of John? So I, I, I disagree that the disciple Jesus loved is the author of Gospel of John, but the, we'll say the disciple Jesus loved, the character in the Gospel of John might have been Mary Magdalene. Um, and so, and the answer is because um, the character is throughout the text and I, it's pretty much described as I'm mean, pretty sure it's kind of described as male um, yeah, in the yeah, text. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So yeah, so he says to, in the, from the cross, um, Jesus says to Mary, Mary, this is your son, indicating the disciple Jesus loved. Um, and, so, and so it's a male, and so it, it won't have been Mary Magdalene. Uh, and so that's why. <laughs> and so which do I think was the disciple Jesus loved? So the, the most likely scenario, um, it would be, it would, the, the most scholars agree, we don't have, there's no scholarly consensus at all. The, let's say the leading theory is that it's, this is a literary and that the, um, the author here is wanting you, the reader, to put yourself in the shoes of this disciple. So you're running alongside Peter and trying to get race to the tomb uh, at the same time as him and so forth. And so, and so potentially it's, um, it's in the same way um, Mark has a literary goal of trying to get you to be the one who says the testimony of Jesus. Who do you think that I am? And Jesus is asking the reader essentially in, in Mark. Um, this may be a literary device uh, that... Um, the author of the Gospel of John is is maybe using to get you into the text, or um, another theory is that it's a fully anonymous um, disciple in the sense of not an important person, but but in the Johannine community, um, maybe there had been by the time this book is written, which is late, there they have one guy who actually knew the historical Jesus actually met them, but the person who was not. Um, let's say, important to the story, but is, is, a, is thought of as being a beloved disciple in that community. Uh, and so not a leader type, not a, not a prominent person, but simply the last surviving person that had actually known the historical Jesus. That's a theory. Um, another theory that um, is possible uh, because of the way it's described in the text is uh, Lazarus. And so... Um, Lazarus is also just being described as, as uh, loved by Jesus and uh, in the Gospel of John. And anyway, there's, there's indications why and theories why anyway Lazarus is a candidate. Um, it's, you know, it, John is not, not a candidate, but there's no, there's no particular, um, there's nothing in the text. The problem is, is that there's the sons of Zebedee are listed as, you know, as uh, as separate and and not called out by name in the text, and so it, it seems very strange that um, that that the John son of Zebedee would then also be the beloved disciple. So it's, that that's why that association doesn't seem as likely. Uh, Angel Ortiz says, "Could Mary Magdalene be considered the first woman apostle, 
or just an apostle because she was a witness to Jesus' ministry and resurrection. So traditionally, um, yes. So the traditional understanding of it, so if we, if we just understand um, the Jesus of scriptures and we, and we go from the scripture narrative, um, Mary Magdalene is on, um, in both John and the Synoptic Gospels, either the first or among the first of the people to, to have a vision or to be uh, in the presence of the risen Christ. And so then she and other women go and talk to the apostle, male apostles, and, and, and are traditionally therefore titled apostle to the apostles because they're the ones who are the first sent from the risen Christ to the ap other apostles, the male apostles, and then the male apostles only after that do they have visions of the risen Christ. The, um, that isn't how Paul uh, says it. So as we, um, so I wish if, I wish in that testimony that Paul gives where he says, uh, you know, um, Christ first appeared to Peter and then the 12 and then to 500 women and men uh, disciples and then, then to John, I'm sorry, to, to James, his brother of Jesus, and then to the uh, other apostles. And then finally to me. Um, I, I wish he'd said Mary <laughs> first, you know, so if he had said, you know, if he said Mary first, then we'd have the perfect multiple, you know, additional multiple attestation, because that's really the earliest one. And again, the kicker, obviously, when we can have Paul saying it, um, but we don't have that. So he leaves that out. And so that would be the only thing, you know, so it's definitely a tradition that is in the, um, that passion source. If so if there's a passion source that underlies both Mark and John, um, that's why we have this um, sense of Mary. So in any event, it was a very early association of Mary um, with vision of the risen Christ. And, and so, um, and as we understand it and celebrate it in the Christian church, we can definitely say she's an apostle to the apostles. Um, Michelangelo Sanchez says, let's see. Um, oh man. Andrew just went away and I cannot get this thing to scroll. So Michelangelo Sanchez says, center place, what do you think of the idea that the beloved might refer to Lazarus? So I did make, just mention that. And so, um, and so you and I are thinking on the same, same way of like, so um, it's, I think it's a, there's a compelling case because um, Lazarus has an interesting role here. So Lazarus is um, um, raised uh, from the dead by Jesus, but he's also referred to as being loved by Jesus in the text uh, where you know, John, which is talking about the beloved disciple. Um, and there's also, um, there's also some other connections. I made the case for this in a uh, lecture on, um, on the resurrection uh, as sacred story as opposed to as, as history. Um, Leandro, I can't, this won't, this won't scroll. So could you help me out with the next just finished the Lazarus one. Ron Wagner says, John um, mentioned James the Greater and James the Lesser. And so is James the brother of Jesus a different apostle? Yes. <laughs> so, so, um, so James the Greater, James the Lesser, and James the son of Alphaeus, the, um, uh, the apostle, those are actually all different, although James the Lesser and James, son of Alphaeus, the apostle, are always conflated. And then James, the brother of Jesus, is a very different apostle um, and understood to be an apostle by Paul and understood to be one of the most important pillars and in, actually, indeed, the most important pillar of the church. It's understood by Paul. And he's understood by Josephus to be um, a leader of a community in in Jerusalem, uh, and so uh, and so he is an apostle, yes, but he is not one of the twelve. And so when I was going through the, the whole list of the twelve at the end, um, he's not on that list. And in fact, so Paul kind of clearly doesn't have him on the list. Certainly, Mark doesn't have him on the list. But he is an apostle, and he's a known historical figure. Yes. So Nathaniel Smith says, is there any connection between wandering, begging apostles and cynics like Diogenes? So this is a, um, this is a, one of the core theories of the historical Jesus and the Jesus movement. Um, and so if you read um, books like by uh, John Dominic Crossan, who's one of the, 
leading scholars of the quest for the historical Jesus, um, they make this case that uh, the thing that, that these begging mendicant apostles are doing and their kind of philosophy that they're uh, preaching about the kingdom uh, of God and how the last is first and the first is last and, and overturning all kinds of social expectations, canceling debt and all, all this sort of thing um, is very similar to what contemporary um, Greek uh, philosophical uh, mendicants like Diogenes, you know, and all of his disciples that um, at this point have flooded the, uh, it becomes, cynics become very popular and it becomes a trope uh, throughout the, um, uh, the Roman world to have these kind of mendicant uh, philosophers that are, uh, that are also performance artists that are kind of preaching and, and being outrageous and things like that. Um, and so the idea is that, again, these are mixed communities. We have even in, in Peter's own family, his brother has a a Greek name, um, uh, Nazareth, uh, you know, is just a brief walk away from uh, a Hellenistic Greek-speaking capital of uh, the Galilee, and same thing, there's another one in, uh, on, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, so interspersed is with, um, especially in Galilee, uh, with people who are of Jewish background, who are practicing adherents of Second Temple Judaism, like Jesus and his disciples, there are right next to them um, uh, Greek-speaking, Greek-influenced Hellenistic peoples that may well include, um, you know, practicing philosophers that are cynics on the model of Diogenes. And so uh, that's certainly been a, a connection and association that um, uh, scholars of the historical Jesus have tried to make. Uh, and so I'd say that that's um, whereas it's not, um, there's no consensus uh, about the picture of the historical Jesus. As I've said, there are multiple academically defensible um, portraits that you can have. And I'd say that the most popular portrait is the one uh, by Bart Ehrman, who was talking about Jesus as a failed apocalyptic prophet. But the second most popular one is like Crossan and other, other scholars who are, are, are saying finding Jesus on the model of a of a Jewish style, um, you know, Diogenes kind of thing, uh, not dependent on Diogenes, but growing in in the same solution to uh, the same kind of problems that are being faced in the in the Jewish community. Humbling, hu humbly, qu humbly questioning. Oh yeah, humbly questioning. This is the name. <laughs> okay, uh, they write and ask center place. Why do you think uh, the mendicant lifestyle failed to be venerated in modern Christianity, unlike other religions like Hinduism? So, um, it was, by the way, the it was the central way that Christianity was practiced um, in antiquity and all through the Middle Ages. So, so we don't think of it now, but um, monks and nuns, and then also. Uh, wandering friars and canons and so forth, um, that was really what Christianity was about in antiquity and especially all through the Middle Ages. Um, and so, uh, anyway, so it had been very important. Uh, at a certain point, though, uh, especially, you know, during the um, Protestant Reformation, um, you know, there were different reasons why monasticism just ceased to be popular. And so, so on the one hand, um, the monastic houses had a lot of property. They just became rich. They were not, they, they had had continual reform, you know, as you had at first, you know, Benedictines, then the Benedictines went to the um, Cluniacs. Cluniacs were, it got too rich and, and needed to be reformed, and so then you had Cistercians. The Cistercians uh, were really harsh, but then they got really rich and needed to be reformed, and so then you had Franciscans, and so on. In other words, there was this all of these waves of, uh, because you have a, a movement that starts out really um, exciting and that everybody wants to be part of, and then everybody donates all this money to it, it becomes really rich, and then the next generation, they're really rich, and they don't want to go around and beg for food anymore, you know? And so, and so at a certain point, there's a bunch of rich monasteries, there's not a lot of sympathy for them, and so like opportunistic kings like Henry VIII are able to simply dissolve all the monasteries, and in one of the greatest uh, um, 
uh, bits of vandalism in all of English history, uh, destroyed them all and uh, took all the property, sold it all to his followers, rewarded it and everything, broke up libraries, destroyed everything. It was just a mess, you know? So, um, and so, it, so for especially the Anglo-Protestant world, um, that more or less, you know, eliminated this whole mendicant lifestyle, this kind of monastic or friar-like um, um, uh, piety from just purged it from the Christian tradition. Of course, monks and nuns and so on continue on in uh, Catholic and Orthodox tradition. And so it hasn't ceased to be venerated in modern Christianity, but you don't, it's, um, people are, I think they're still way less willing to go off and live in a monastery than they used to. And, and, and it's certainly not being, um, it's not being uh, practiced, let's say in public as much. So where Franciscans are running around and doing this as, as, as uh, well, the way, for example, Hinduism and, and Buddhist monks do. Um, Bob Garrison, is speaking in the spirit uh, the same thing as modern day speaking in tongues? No, although it is sort of the same. I mean, they're both, speaking in tongues is a form of speaking in the spirit. And so um, speaking in the spirit is a person uh, is in a sense of, let's say, ecstatic, revelatory, um, uh, thing where they where they're in a in a sense in a big in a big meeting and they are uh, with all the people around and they um, they may have started out by preaching from scripture and so on uh, and and now they maybe they've been fasting and so on and so now they start to um, make pronouncements and they could be from a a standpoint of let's say thus saith the Lord you know you you know repent your iniquity and this kind of thing so it can be in a very much in the language that everyone understands and then speaking in tongues or glossolalia is when you're doing the same thing but instead of um, instead of speaking actual uh, language you're you're making noises that are not actually language uh, automatic noises and then but the same thing happens because whenever there's tongues there is interpretation of tongues and so someone else will speak and say you know translate into your own language English you know in our case for what that means and so it's um, it's the same experience but speaking in tongues is a subset of it so you don't have to have the tongues uh, to make it speaking in the spirit um, Okay, Michelangelo Sanchez says, what would um, uh, be the meaning of the, uh, being called Sons of Thunder? Um, Stephanie pointed out that it's assumed to mean they're quarrelsome brothers or that they just made a lot of noise. And it actually, yeah, it doesn't, it isn't clear because actually even the, um, um, even the name when they say Boyanid cheese or whatever, however it is, it doesn't actually make sense as a Aramaic word even. And so it, it's, it's unclear, um, it's not entirely clear. So it's kind of, a, there's a lot of surmise and that's certainly, Stephanie is, um, is, is giving uh, a, one of the best surmises, you know, that they're either quarrelsome or that they're, I don't know, they're, they're, they're powerful speakers or, or something like that. Um, but in any event, uh, you know, whether or not, whether if that's a historical name or whether Mark just um, coined it in order to, um, in order to make a connection between these two or something like that, it doesn't stick. And so uh, unlike, unlike Cephas and Peter, which pretty much we probably forget that Peter's name is actually Simon. I don't think people think of, and sometimes people say Simon Peter, right? But generally speaking, we think of the apostle Peter and we think of him by that name. So that's a nickname that really stuck. Whereas this one, I can never even remember what, what, what the actual name is because it's, it's never used again. Um, Kenneth Gregory asks, which book uh, lists Mark as an apostle? So, um, so Mark is not, well, so, Mark, so again, Mark is an apostle, but not one of the 12. And so, uh, again, the gospel of Mark is an anonymous text. It is not written by a person named Mark. In the second century, the name Mark gets attached to it. Uh, Mark is a um, there's a, it, it, there's a couple marks. And so there's a character, um, 
I think it's John Mark, and so and 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 there's a characters that exist in in Acts, and there's characters that exist in in Paul's letters, and that's where the name Mark comes from, and it gets attached. Uh, Mark is um, in in the book of Acts is listed as. It's either in the book of Acts as listed as one of the 70 or just Christ, or Christian tradition lists Mark among the 70 apostles. And so it's not, um, so it's not one of the 12, but he would be a different apostle. Yeah. So Normative asks, if the Matthew and Luke authors have access to Mark, why do we think they changed the list of the 12? Is it just a matter of variant oral traditions or does it to some make some other point? Um, so they didn't change it too much. And so I do not know, um, so Matthew pretty much follows it, uh, follows Mark's list, um, uh, which Matthew tends to do because Matthew includes almost all of Mark. So Matthew, um, Matthew is much more um, of a view, I think, that his sources are authoritative and so he doesn't want to, um, he'll make corrections to Mark, but he doesn't want to delete Mark. Whereas Luke, the author of Luke, is much less um, uh, stuck in the mud on that, and is much more, um, when disagrees with Mark, is much more liable to delete Mark and make significant changes to Mark, and to also create or add a lot of creative material, so Luke is much longer and so forth. Um, which is why, because of Luke's capacity to do that, this is why I, I myself am quite skeptical of a lot of the historicity of the book of Acts, which I think might contain a lot of uh, Luke's own creative uh, innovation, you know, composition. And so Luke makes changes. Um, there may be a, a reason why that was unknown to us, why um, Luke wanted to have this particular um, uh, name, Jude of James, be on the apostle list as opposed to uh, whoever gets kicked out uh, after that Thaddeus or whatever it is. So, um, and so it may well be that, you know, by swapping out the least um, uh, important apostle, uh, Luke puts in uh, somebody who they have in their community who they would like to have be one of the 12 or something like that. That's just speculation. We don't know, but it's not much change, but I would say, no, it's not a matter of variant oral traditions because they are directly working from uh, Luke, uh, Mark's text as a, um, as, as literarily dependent. And so uh, changes that Luke makes are based on uh, Luke's own editorial, uh, idiosyncratic, and, and also um, agenda items, you know, where Luke um, doesn't like some of the things Mark, Mark's understanding of Christianity and so wants to correct it even as uh, the preface to Luke says. Uh, because Luke has got access to things that haven't been told properly, they're 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 setting out to write a better version. Um, Bob Garrison, do you include the modern apostles in the LDS uh, and Community of Christ in my larger group of apostles? So uh, when I drew that that chart, when I had the twelve and I had um, the larger group. That was specifically, I was specifically referring to first century um, apostles because we were trying to trace out here um, historical apostles. And I was kind of outlining um, uh, both the apostles as a kind of pre in the pre Jesus movement, but as it, as it evolved into the earliest phases of Christianity. And then also, um, I also though wanted to draw the line between people who knew Jesus, the historical Jesus and Jesus' lifetime, and what could we say about any of them? And obviously we found that we can't say too much about many of them, um, but that's what I meant in my chart. In terms of uh, modern apostles, either in the restoration tradition or actually there's many, um, many traditions that, uh, that kind of use the term apostles, even the, um, the, the heirs of apostolic heirs in, in Orthodox and, all, and the Catholic Church has also considered themselves you know, apostolic successors. And so the, um, you know, the uh, Bishop of Alexandria is the, uh, is the apostolic heir to Mark. The, the Bishop of Rome is the apostolic heir to Peter. The Bishop of Constantinople is the apostolic heir to Andrew and so forth. So they consider themselves apostles. So I wasn't meaning that, but, I mean the, but the term continues to be, uh, to be used. And Bob also asked, what is a 70 in community of Christ? And so in the same way that um, in the Gospel of Luke, 
Luke sends out 12 apostles, and we have 12 in Community of Christ, uh, which are the, the core apostles that have responsibilities over the different um, uh, mission fields of the church. And so in here in Canada, in the Community of Christ, our Canadian apostle is Art Smith, and his field includes um, not just Canada, but also um, Haiti and uh, parts of Mexico, Mexico and, uh, and uh, some parts of the Caribbean and so forth. And so that's kind of his apostolic field, and the whole planet is divided into 12 fields in Community of Christ. And then the 70 then are essentially uh, 70, you know, the idea of it, symbolically 70 more apostles that are sent out um, to uh, be missionaries and to evangelize and to proclaim the good news and so forth, the same idea as, so it's an outreach uh, ministry. And we just, we do have more than 70 of them, but there's not, um, it's, a, it's a smaller number than, than, for example, other roles in the church, well, like, like elder, where we have more elders, for example. Humbly questioning says, if uh, one rejects the Hugh hypothesis in favor of the Farrer hypothesis, how does this uh, create or resolve conflicts in the accounts of the apostles? So, I don't know. See, I don't know that that it, it, I don't know that it would be too. I'm not depending on Q too much for um, for what we're saying here about the apostles, um, and, and you have the text either way, right? So, um, and so that same um, whether or not you whether or not you agree, agree with the Q hypothesis, I'm not quoting from like lost texts. I'm quoting from. Um, you know, the, the text as we have them in Luke and Mark, I'm sorry, Luke and Matthew. So wherever that came from uh, to describe the, um, uh, the 12 sitting on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel, um, I don't think that that's any different whether Q exists or not. I'm just, I just mentioned it in, in, in light of the Q hypothesis, right? But uh, it's still going to be kind of the earliest tradition that we have as to what's the purpose of the 12. Um, and that's what the main thing I was relying, I think, on for Q text in talking about the apostles. Oh, I'll, also, there's an, the, also that, the tradition of the, of the second um, sending forth, the sending forth of the 70. But that list is almost identical to the list in Mark anyway. So again, it, it, it really wouldn't change anything uh, between the two hypotheses, I think. Um, fundamentalists tend to affirm the Matthian priority. Um, does this position lead to unexpected accounts of the apostles? So yeah, so I agree um, that this uh, this traditional error, uh, assuming that Matthew is the first gospel uh, because of this, uh, mis this statement that's misunderstood or whatever Pepeus is saying that it is not applied properly uh, not in, and is not replied to the actual text of the gospel attributed to Matthew. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Fundamentalists... Um, misread the text. They assume the text is, is history. It's not. It's, like I say, contradictory. So, um, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the fundamentalists just read it all and they assume every one of those figures is, is history and they did exactly the thing that says it in the text. And, and so they're simply making um, uh, a false assumption that, uh, that has no historical basis. So we can say it's a belief that you have, but it's, um, from a historical perspective, is a false belief. You can have it as a religious belief. You can have it, but it's but, and you just can't make historical claims because, from a historical basis, it's false. Humbly questioning: uh, To what extent does Homeric mimesis of uh, Dennis R. Macdonald variety impact the character development of the apostles? How many apostles are pure narrative constructs? Well, yeah, exactly. So. Um, like I was saying, especially when we are getting details um, of apostles in the Gospel of John, um, John kind of is clearly, I think, having these um, these long created conversations. You know, it's an entirely um, it's an entirely literary kind of a literary construct because um, you know, so so when when in Mark or in Q or the you know, Matthew and Luke sayings that they have preserved, whether it's Q or not. Um, we, we have uh, sayings attributed to Jesus that are things like, like parables and pithy sayings and things that would make it through and survive um, 
uh, and survive oral tradition. And so they may be, you know, oral tradition is going on, and then at some point or other, um, some of these sayings are written down, and that becomes uh, things like the Q source or Thomas or uh, maybe a, a list of sayings that Mark had access to, since there's also sayings there, sayings that the author of uh, the Epistle of James had access to, and so forth. Um, whereas in John, these are kind of like long conversations that wouldn't have been from an oral tradition. They're, they're, they're something that somebody has to compose literarily um, when, when it's being written. And so again, the kind of character and description like of Thomas and uh, and Philip and that, that get there that get fleshed out in John they, those would probably I would say be narrative constructs um, certainly then um, we don't know the rest right <laughs> so so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of indication uh, that that Mark which is the earliest uh, narrative is pulled so strongly from um, the way Christians read uh, texts out of the Old Testament um, that that it's it's a it's it's something that is um, told and based on that as opposed to um, as opposed to from memory or something like that. In other words, something that they knew uh, a witness that had known the tradition or something like that. So in that case, um, most of the narrative that comes also from the synoptics uh, would be narrative constructs as opposed to anything we know. And so under that circumstance, if, we, if we're, if we're going to take it that way, which is, one, is certainly a possible and defensible position, then, um, then we know almost nothing about any of the apostles other than what, what, um, what Paul says, you know, that there, there were three of them that we can name and, uh, and uh, one of whom was the leader, uh, you know, James, Jesus' brother Jacob, James, uh, was the leader of the group in Jerusalem and who was later killed, as Josephus also says. Normative asks, um, just the one from earlier about the, about the list of the 12, do we think that there's some rationale to um, the Matthew and Luke authors replicating Mark but altering the roster? So yeah, I, um, you probably, you asked that question before I answered it when somebody else asked it. Um, but essentially I was saying that um, that, that the rationale always with Luke is so it's not much changed, um, but usually Luke has a Luke has a reason to do it. Um, why um, so Matthew's change is why Matthew decided to um, why the author of Matthew decided to conflate um, the name Matthew with Levi the publican I, it's unclear. It doesn't know, he doesn't always do things like that, but um, that happened and that makes that conflation happen, which is one of the reasons why. Um, Probably people thought, you know, that that the author had a special connection to Matthew, and then attributed the name Matthew to the text later. Um, but of course, it's not something where where Jesus comes along and goes to Matthew, and then he says, and then he came to I Matthew, and I Matthew followed him, or something like that. It's not it's not written from that perspective at all. Alexander Laco asks, is Matthias replacing Judas in the book of Acts proof of apostolic succession and the claims of Catholics, Orthodox, and Oriental Orthodox Christians? Um, so I would say no, because, um, because for one thing, the, the 12 as a group did not go here, no matter what, um, you know, there's no 12 that continues in the Catholic Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox Christians. So what's happening in um, the book of Acts is, uh, again, we have this broader group of, of apostles of which the 12 were 12 of them had, who had a special um, function as symbolic of the tribes of Israel. And one of those is gone. And so they replace that one in the book of Acts. Um, but they replaced, you know, they had, they had a couple options of who they were going to stick in there and they, and they draw lots in order to pick Matthias. But it's, in other words, there's plenty of other apostles. And so, and so the fact that the, um, that they do that in Acts, which is not tested anywhere else is, um, uh, just shows that in the beginning of Acts, they, they're, they're continuing to constitute the 12 as a group. That group does not continue in any tradition 
uh, in the Catholic, Orthodox, and Oriental Orthodox do talk about apostolic succession, but that's succession of the bishops. And so the, um, the idea is um, in those churches, they have a tradition that different apostles became the first bishop of different places, but there is no good really good attestation of any of those. So in a lot of cases, um, they're, um, you know, the, 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 tr the, the, the tradition is a, get, you know, misses it by a century or maybe less. Uh, there are indications, for example, in the Roman church at the end of the first century that it's not being led by bishops that is more got a council or something like that. And so, so if Peter was the first bishop, we don't have this, this, this good, um, evidence for a succession that happens. And so what we can say is there is a very ancient tradition of succession of bishops where uh, one goes one bishop followed by another bishop and so forth that goes all the way back in a lot of cases to um, at least the second century, um, in some cases third and fourth century and so forth. But, um, but to get to that uh, last little leap to get to apostolic um, succession, um, isn't you know you have to you have to base that on just tradition. It's not proved that it doesn't happen, but we don't have a good a basis that does prove it. Um, Miguel Sanchez, Miguel Angelo Sanchez. Um, are there other Judas-like figures which could have been the basis for the character, or is it an original figure? How possible is it for him to have been a real person? I'm going to cough. <coughs> So as we, as we kind of pointed out, the, the interesting thing about Judas is that he has a lot of multiple attestation. Um, he is very early in the tradition, so he's uh, known, the, the, the idea of it seems to be known to Paul. It's in, the, it's in a pre-passion story, so because it's known to both um, Mark as one of the twelve and John as one of the twelve, and so... Um, and so it's kind of crazy how, how early it is, because you think of that as being, um, I don't know, very literary, right? <laughs> but so how possible is it? You know, he's, it's possible because he's one of the people that we have, let's say, maybe some of the best attestation for. So to the extent to which any part of the passion story, um, other than just the essentials of, you know, Jesus being crucified, um, um, to the extent that any of that has a historical basis as opposed to being, a, let's say, a, like a, a religious construct, um, then it's possible that he is a, a, host, a, a, a real person, yes. So, so I would say that um, on the list, I put him fourth, right? So um, much more so than a lot of the other ones, but we don't know for sure. But it's, um, it's interesting. It's intriguing. <laughs> All right. Well, my goodness, what a night. <laughs> I felt like we did a lot more than 12 apostles. There's lots of apostles and, and lots of great discussion. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, we'll have another lecture next week, but I have not decided what it will be on yet. So uh, talk to you soon.